Okay, uh, I think we should get started. So more people may join, but that's okay. Uh, my name's Adrian Jackson from EPCC at the University of Edinburgh, and thanks for coming along to this uh, virtual tutorial where today I'm talking about uh, Fortran, uh, and particularly uh, newer features of a Fortran language, uh, but also how to what you would need to look at to move from an old Fortran program or a program written in older versions of a Fortran language to a to more modern and why you may want to do that. Uh, people are quite often out, outside the area we work in computational simulation and, and these kind of things. People are quite often surprised that we're still talking about Fortran, but I always like to point them to the to the Archer stats, which tell them that uh, you know 75 or 80 percent of a runtime in Archer is still being used by Fortran codes and also you know we know from experience that there is still a lot of codes around which were written in Fortran 77 or Fortran 77 like uh, languages so as you know postdocs and PhD students and researchers it's not uncommon for people to come into contact with these kind of applications and there are times when it may make sense to try and do some work to modernize them to move them into newer versions of their of a language. Um, you now, Fortran has been around for a while, uh, 1967 or thereabouts, um, formula translation. Uh, but it, it like, like nearly all computer programming languages, changes over time. So the language is defined in the standard. The standard is formalized at some point. And then, of course, once the language is formalized, people find mistakes or Parts of the, the standard which are not quite as clear as people would like. So there's always a, a push to uh, update the language standard. And then people say, OK, well, this is nice, but it would be nice if I could do some new things with this language as well, because I've got this new piece of hardware or this new way of programming. Can I do that? So over time, languages, most languages, Fortran as well, change. They have things added possibly things taken away uh, and think things clarified. And you can see from this slide, hopefully, that Fortran has you know, moved over the past 40 or 50 years, has moved forwards um, and also um, is still moving forward. So people are still working on the next versions of Fortran. The latest version, Fortran 2018, um, is not long uh, formalized. I think it was formalized in November. 2018. It was at some point going to be called Fortran 2015, uh, but it took a long time for that to uh, to formalize. So um, uh, it moved on to for, for Fortran 2018. Uh, over time, the Fortran standard actually follows this sort of um, this sort of process where it has a major revision. So big new things are added to the language, and then a, a few years later, a minor revision. So corrections and slight updates uh, uh, added to the language. Uh, the, the interesting things about these uh, changes to the language is that there was a big change between 90, Fortran 77 and Fortran 90. So sort of a major revision, um, lots of new stuff added, uh, a new way of writing your programs. And then after that, there was also another major revision in 2003, which brought in things which were sort of beyond scope for Fortran before that, sort of object-oriented um, functionality, which we'll talk about. And then after 2003, there have been new things, but they tend to be more around new ways of parallelizing Fortran, new functionality like that. Um, so you may be interested in it, but uh, there's a, a piece of uh, functionality called co-arrays, which is a way of a different way of parallelizing your program, uh, not using something like MPI. But, but using the Fortran compiler to generate code, to do your parallelization for you, which is really interesting. Uh, a pro is slightly separate from the, the language stuff that we'll be talking about here. Um, so, okay, uh, one, one of the most notable changes that you would see if you do Fortran and uh, programming, and you've seen Fortran 77 and Fortran 90 programs, is the change to sort of, um, how you're allowed to write the Fortran. So the text character changes. Moving from in, in Fortran 77, 
what was a fixed format text file where you had to uh, write in certain uh, places in the file to do certain things. Um, so up to uh, a free format programming file where where the position of your words and your characters in the file do, doesn't really matter. And, and there was a whole bunch of things that came in here. So you could have names longer than six characters in Fortran 90 officially. I mean, a lot of the compilers already supported that, uh, but but it was a support of the standard. So you could now have quite descriptive uh, variable and subroutine and program name. You can do changes to where you can do your comments. Uh, but of course, it, it brings in other restrictions. So in Fortran 77, you could have spaces inside, um, inspire, inside things, inside sort of numbers, whereas um, in Fortran 19, the freeform format, you can't because it's not no longer relying on characters being in specific specific columns to work out whether the, what, whether they are special things or not. Um, and you have a new way of continuing lines. So the ampersand character at the end splits the line across the road, across across uh, multiple uh, lines. But you know these are pretty easy text changes to to um, achieve or to move towards or to understand. There there are in your know, convention a .f file is a fixed format file, so an f77 file and a .f90 file is a is a free format one but you can also tell the compiler treat this as, as if it was free format or, or treat this as if it was fixed format uh, another big thing which came in which of course if you've if you've ever been taught for at all you'll know about is the implicit none um declaration so actually this was only formalized in the program language in in the Fortran 900 but it actually had been supported by most of the compilers prior to this anyway. And really this is um, a recognition that Fortran 77 was designed uh, to support environments where you had very small amounts of memory to store your program instructions in, so you didn't want to waste any of that memory, you know, writing this is an integer, this is a float, this is a double, all those kind of things. So, so there was a functionality to do implicit typing, which meant you can start your variables with a, a letter. And if that letter was in a certain range, say if that letter was I, that would mean it was an integer. And if that letter was R, it would mean it was a real. So, you know, at some point in the past, that was useful functionality, but it makes it very hard to, to properly uh, write safe programs because it's not always clear. Um, when you're reading through your program, whether variables have been mistyped, you know, by accident, that should have been a, a real, but it's actually an integer and that changes the behavior of the program. So with this keyword implicit none, you can add this to your program um, in your main program, in your subroutines and functions and in, in modules. And that forces the compiler to say, have the variables you're using been defined. Uh, so it's just a, a sort of a, a safety thing for programmers, but but makes it much easier to define, to to write uh, and build and use correct code. There's also uh, this introduction of a double colon uh, uh, characters to allow you to to define and and uh, specify attributes for variables whilst you're writing them. So. You can do integer comma parameter double colon and then the name of the integer rather than before you had to separate these things out and say well this variable is an integer and then it's a parameter uh, these, are, these are minor things another feature which came in uh, designed to help with correctness again but also a little bit of performance is this idea of intent type, uh, variable uh, declarations or in, intent attributes so you can add intent in, intent out, and intent in out, where you define a variable for a subroutine. So this says you've defined a variable for a subroutine, but you're also giving it the compiler a bit more information. Oh, I, I only expect this variable to be used to pass data into the subroutine, 
or I only expect this variable to be used to pass data out of a subroutine or both. And that can be very useful because it, it, it can let the compiler check correctness. I, you said you were only going to pass data in, but you've changed that data inside the subroutine and I, you know, you're not expecting me to pass it back out. Was that the right thing to do? But it also lets it do some optimization where if you, if you are passing in large arrays, copying stuff in and out can take a long time. So if you say, oh, I'll only copy this in, but I don't want to copy it back out, it can save some time by not doing that. So that's a very useful uh, thing to be able to uh, decorate your program with. And we'll see hopefully some examples. I think I'll include some examples um, later on in the, in, the, in the lecture. If not, I'll add them in. They're slightly different do loops. So rather than um, using sort of computed go to's, where the second example is here, where it says do 10, 1, i equals 1 to 10, and then it has a, a line number, and that's how you do your um, do loops in, in Fortran 77 and earlier. There's an explicit do and do. Um, and with the addition of exit and cycle keywords, so you can say do this loop for, for 10 iterations, but if i equals 5, skip the iteration and go on to the next one or do this loop for 10 iterations, but if X gets above 100, exit the loop, even if you haven't done your 10 iterations. And those, those two can be useful for controlling uh, program flow. The other thing that came, another thing that came in then was uh, dynamic memory. So very useful for writing programs which can deal with um, arbitrary size input data, so you don't have to predefine up front all, all your array sizes and then worry that you're trying to use data that's smaller or bigger than that. Uh, and that's done using this allocatable attribute of variables. So here we go, I've got a real variable. Um, it's an array called Charles with two dimensions, on, and we can see that because I've specified brackets, colon, comma, colon, here. Uh, and it's allocatable. So allocatable here is a attribute of the array. Okay. The nice thing about Fortran memory management is that it's not as low level as, as say doing it in C. Um, if it will, it will, the compiler will put in the necessary code to work out when you created the data of a variable. Uh, and then when that variable can no longer be used, and it will automatically clean up your memory for you. So it automatically deallocates the variable memory when it goes out of scope, unless you've added a special attribute to it called save, and then it won't do that. And then it's your responsibility to do that. But in general, you can allocate things inside subroutines and not worry that you're going to have a memory leak next time you come round because it, it automatically deallocates them. And actually, quite interestingly, a lot of the new C++ memory functionality does uh, does similar kinds of, of things. But, but Fortran has, you know, it's been there for a long time. So, so you declare the variables allocatable. And then at some point before you use it, you have to actually allocate it. So you have to say, OK, now, uh, create the memory space for me to be using. So you pass in the name of a variable to this function called allocate, and then you specify the size of the dimensions. You can also, um, which can be quite nice for code which is reused elsewhere, you can also add in this check here. So you, there's a, another function not called allocate this time, but now called allocated, where you can say, have I allocated this variable, this array? If not, do something. Uh, um, otherwise, that's fine. I've already created it. Oh, here we go. And then, as as we've already uh, said, you can manually deallocate variables, and it's good practice to do that. But it's not always necessary um, because if you forget to do that, Fortran should um, set you know set it up so that it is done for you. You all. Um, you often will see in Fortran 77 programs um, declarations where there's a star and a number after the type of the variable you're using. So in this case, integer star four and real star eight. 
And this is functionality designed to allow you to say, I want you to store this in four bytes of memory or eight bytes of memory. And that's d designed to allow you to be able to, you know, deal with data that requires a large amount of um, bytes to store it in. So you can, if you, if you know you're only going to be using small integers, you can say, I only need a, a small number of bytes here. But if you know, if your numbers are going to get very large, you can manually specify, okay, for that variable, I need to have a large amount of storage for this. And that's fine. That works, no problem with that. Uh, but it's not very um, portable um, or easy to program with for a whole program. So uh, Fortran 90 introduces some more programmable ways to do this. Uh, specifically, you can use this select int kind or select real kind um, to actually specify at a program level, uh, you know, how many how big a number you need to specify. So for select int kind, it's the minimum number of decimal digits required. So here I can store a, a number up to nine numbers uh, long at this point. Um, and you can do the same kind of thing for the, for the reals, for the, the um, real numbers, where you specify um, the a uh, number of decimal points you need, a number of uh, decimal digits you want, and then the size of the exponent. And that will allow you to set up a way of saying, okay, this number here is my small kind of real, and this number is my large kind of integer. And the nice thing is here, this means is you can define these parameters at one place in your program, you know, maybe in a, in a single module where you define all your numbers and then then you can use them everywhere in the program. And then if you want to, at some point, change your program to use a different numeric precision, you just have to change it in that one place, recompile, and away you go. So we see nowadays people very interested in, in looking at double precision numbers, but then also half precision and quarter precision numbers for things like uh, machine learning or, or, or just to be more efficient. And this gives you quite a nice uh, way of doing this. If you declare all your variables sort of real kind equals parameter name, real kind equals small real, then you can change that small real somewhere from eight bytes to four bytes, rerun your program and see what impact it has. And so that, that's a, a little bit of a cleaner feature than having to go through and replace all your real star eights with real star fours. You just have to change it in one place then. Fortran 90 also uh, is array operations, so you can do uh, operations of, on a whole array or a whole set of arrays or on subsets of arrays where we can say b equals c plus b. Um, and as long as b, c, and d are effectively the same size and shape of arrays, it will go away and it will do all the operations required to update all the elements of b with all the elements of C plus all the elements of D in the correct way. Um, so this means uh, you can easily write this yourself. You just have to do a loop, you know, over all the elements of it, B and C and D. But this is a nicer, cleaner way of writing the program because you can just have a single line to do a full array operation. Uh, and it doesn't have to be single arrays. Um, it can be subsets of those arrays. So you can use this brackets colon note to select different parts of the arrays. So you can say, for instance, I want the whole array. I want from one you know, element 10 to, to the end. I want from the beginning to element 10 and, and any subset in between there. So again, nothing that will necessarily change your um, correctness or the performance of your program, but it is a way of writing programs more simply more uh, understandably uh, and matching sort of more mathematical language, which is which can be nice. Uh, the, what, yes, and, and so you can also make these uh, in a slightly more uh, um, complex format based on the array operations based on logical parameters. So I can say everywhere in this array P, where P is greater than zero, set 
set that element to equal a log of that element. So, so you don't have to apply operations to the full array because you could imagine, you know, you, you don't want to do um, square root of minus one, for instance. You could say everywhere where p is not equal to minus one, then p equals square root p, um, and that would be perfectly fine. And there are other functions here as well, so not just where, but count. So it counts all the elements of the array in this context, which are greater than zero, or you can sum up the array, or you can calculate the modulus of the array, and there's, there's a bunch of these things going on. So there is quite a lot of nice array-based functionality for the fourth one. So those were th uh, things to to change the um, or to improve the functionality the language provides um, and the way we can structure our programs. Going beyond that, there was a whole bunch of new additions designed to further improve how you structure large programs and how you introduce some software engineering features into it into the language. Uh, and the sort of first and biggest is this idea of modules where you can group together data or variables and functions or subroutines or procedures um, into a single file, uh, but in such a way that it can be used elsewhere in your program, but used safely. So the idea is there's something, there's a keyword called module and then inside that module, you can put what you want. So here, this example is the module is called sort, but I could have called this anything. I could have given it any name I wanted to. I've got my implicit none uh, uh, statement because I'm going to do some variable declarations in this module. So I can create variables in here, which uh, exist inside the module. Um, and then I can also put functions inside here or subroutines. So I've got this contains keyword and anything below there are the sort of functions or subroutines that exist inside the, the module. Anything that's declared at the module level, so above this contains, uh, all the variables declared there can be seen inside the module. So any function or subroutine inside the module can see any variable declared at the top of the module. And we can also use them elsewhere in the program. So uh, we've got, a, I'll go on to an example. Maybe I don't have an example. I should have an example. Uh, oh, yes, here's an example. So here's an example where I've got a program. I've given it a name. And then I use this keyword use. And then this is the name of my uh, module, triangle operations. So anything that I've, if I just say use triangle operations, Anything that I've declared here as a public variable uh, or a public subroutine, I can then use in this program because I've imported it. So you can think of this use statement here as something a bit like in C, including the header file, the module, or in other languages, importing, uh, you know, in Python, it would be import triangle operations. Now, you don't have to include the whole of the module, you can import just as a variable or just a subroutine, that's perfectly fine. Um, the slight complication with using modules is the compiler needs your module to be built, compiled, before it's used anywhere in the program. So it does slightly make your build process, if you've got multiple files, multiple things going on, uh, a little bit more complicated. But it's, it's manageable, generally. Um, we'll, we'll have a look a little bit more in that, but it's generally manageable. Um, the other thing to say is that there's nothing to say you have to put a single module into a single file. Uh, Fortran doesn't really care how you, uh, compilers at least don't really care what files you use. The general approach most people take is to put a, a module in a file. So single file has a single module in it. And that's that's how, it, how they're structured. But there's nothing to stop you having more than one module in the same file. That's uh, perfectly legal. Yes, OK. The, the module system supports this idea of private and public attributes. So you can specify some functions are public, i.e. they can be used outside the module. They can be imported outside the module. 
um, uh, but also some things can be defined as private, i.e. they can only be seen inside that module by functions or subroutines inside that module. And this lets you do a little bit of data scoping and, and encapsulating. So you can say, okay, all this data is important. I don't want any other bits of the program to be messing with it. I'll put it inside a module, make it private, and then I'll add some methods to let you access that data and update it. And so you can call those functions, but you're not accessing the data directly. Um, and that's you know part of the object-oriented programming encapsulation ideas that, that, um, that many languages use. Started to go towards this idea of a class. Now, a module isn't a class, but it's going down that road of saying, I'm grouping together things that are similar, and I'm going to hide some of those things so they're private, so uh, so they can be updated or used inside that model module or through a function or subroutine outside that module. And alongside that, uh, Fortran 90 also brings in derived types. So this is the idea of building data structures yourself. If you're a C programmer, you can imagine it as a struct. Um, but it's the idea of grouping together here now, not function, but data variables together into a single type, which we can reuse elsewhere. So my example I have here, which isn't a very good one, but um, hopefully illustrates it a little bit, is I've got type. So this, this type here is a keyword. And then I've given it a name. I've called it person. But I could have called that anything I wanted to. I could have called it Simon or, uh, or Blue. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what name I give it. And then inside here, I define what variables make up that type. So this particular one has a name, an array, which is a name variable, which is an array of characters of length, maximum length 10. And then an integer, um, which is called office number. OK. And then, I should have said, then you close it off with this end type keyword and the name of the type again. And then I can use that somewhere else. So here I can say type brackets person, because remember that's what I call my type. And then these are the variables themselves, Fred and me. Um, and so I can say, tell me what Fred's name is by using this Fred percent name, uh, or tell me what Fred's office number is, Fred percent office number. And likewise, I can say Fred percent name equals uh, Claire. So I can call Fred Claire. I can say Fred percent office number equals 2.1. Well, I can't say 2.1 because it's an integer. Uh, Fred percent office number equals 10. So you access the individual components of a derived type using this percentage um, character here. Now, derived types can also be used inside derived types. So you can build a hierarchy of these. So here I have a corridor. Inside my corridor has um, people in this array called rooms, and then I have a, another uh, part of it which, which tells me how many rooms I have. So I create my type corridor, A1, and then I can say the first room of, a, of corridor A1, that the person who is in there has this name. Or I can say um, my corridor A1 has 10 rooms. Now, of course, this is poor programming for me here because I've not really linked together the size of my array rooms with the number of rooms I'm using here. And I would need to need to make sure that was was properly updated. And in reality, if you're going to do this in a nice object-oriented way, you'd have a routine to change the size of number of room uh, of the rooms array. And then when you did that, it would automatically update the number of rooms for you. But it's just an example of this, how types can be used inside types and how you're allowed allocatable variables inside types as well. So it's perfectly acceptable to have a derived type with a bunch of allocatable stuff in there. Of course, it's up to you at some point to allocate these, to actually create the space for this dynamic memory here. Uh, there are some other things which came in which you would notice um, using Fortran 77, if you're going to Fortran 90 now, this was um, new type operators and comparison operators. So uh, you have a, 
less than you have less than or equal greater than greater than or equal equal uh, or not equal fortran like a lot of languages tends not to get rid of stuff that was there before so you're actually allowed to use any one of these or any uh, variant of these um, inside your program so you could use dot lt dot or you can just use the less than symbol you can use dot and e dot or you can use uh, forward slash equals uh, and it's quite happy for you to do either of these Wh which you choose is up to you depends which you think is more understandable and then logical variables um, should still be compared with dot eqv dot or dot neqv dot More um, interestingly, alongside the sort of modules and the derived types, there is a um, functionality which comes in in Fortran 90 and 95 to allow you to also write your own operators. So this is to allow you to, to write your own uh, operations where you can take two variables of the same type or of similar types and then perform an operation on it. Now, so my example I have here is I've created a new operator for plus. Uh, and so the keywords I have to use is I'm creating an interface. Um, operator is a keyword in brackets, plus is the actual character I'm going to use to represent my operator. And then I'm binding that to two functions, one called sum, one called int. Okay. This is an interface inside a module, which lets me actually create uh, an operator. Now, uh, this is actually wrong, or, or not wrong, but not allowed in the language because plus is an existing operator. I'm not allowed to override it. I mean, in reality, I would want to probably do to create my own um, uh, special operator. So let's say we're going to use pound sign there but it could be it could be anything we wanted to um do here this is going towards uh operator overloading polymorphism uh, in in object oriented programming it's quite a nice way of doing this um and of course i don't have to use a symbol in there i could have i could have used an actual name in here um so it only really makes sense to do this if you're defining your own data types. But of course, Fortran already knows how to combine its intrinsic data types, how to add and minus and divide and, and uh, multiply and all those kind of things, its own integers and flow, uh, well, reals and, and those kind of complex numbers, those, those kind of data types. This operator overloading or this operator interfacing is designed if you've created your own de derived type. Say you've got a type where you've got two integers in it and you want to be able to add them together. How do you do that? Well, you can create your own operator and then you write your own function or, or subroutine which, which undertakes that task and you define it like this. So with the modules, the operator overloading um, and the public private stuff inside the modules, you really get to a point where you can do quite a lot of sort of object oriented programming with Fortran. So you can group together things inside a module, you can make some things private and some things public. You can have interfaces where you can have one function name outside that module, but depending on what data you pass into it, it calls a different function inside that that's what this interface operator does if i if i call this pound sign with with real numbers it would buy it would call the real sum and if i call this pound sign with integers it would call the integer sum and um, so that lets you have the same function name and reuse it for different input parameters different um variables um so i you know it's almost object origin program, but it's not quite because you haven't really got a full class where you're carrying around all your class data together. Um, you haven't got uh, overloading or, or abstract, abstract types where you can take a module and extend it uh, without having to copy all the stuff that's inside it as easily. So 
there was a whole uh, set of new functionality added into the Fortran 2003 standard, which was designed to provide this, along with other things, actually, along with other things designed to provide this. So I will talk about that um, uh, in a little bit. But that is sort of, it's worth knowing that you can do quite a lot of nice programming with the sort of Fortran 1995 stuff, really, without having to go into the full auditory programming stuff. Structuring using modules, um, reasonably sensible choice of private and public variables and, and functions and uh, subroutines, interfaces so you can reuse the same name for different uh, uh, arguments passed into a function, and you, you've got some quite uh, nice functions. If you are in the place where you have to go take an F77 code and turn it into an F90 code, uh, what are the things you need to be aware of? Well, again, you know, this is really here for, for reference. Come back and have a look at it. But it's putting your implicit nuns in to make sure that typing is explicit. Um, and that may take you a bit of time. OK. Creating sort of more expressive variable names is good if uh, it, uh, because because you don't. There's no longer a restriction for short variable names that FSM didn't have. Had. And using the kind parameters can can let your uh, you create a program which is much simpler to do things with going forwards. Uh, you have some pretty standard things you have to do: convert comments from from a character in column six, I think it is, to just exclamation marks anywhere, uh, and change how the continuation happens. And then, from a design point of view, you probably want to think a bit more about how to use modules, get rid of common blocks, so convert common blocks if your F77 program has them into modules, um, and how you group your code together. When you're going to create a module, you, the, the nicest thing to do is create it as private by default, so you can specify <clears throat> at the module level whether things are private or public by default, um, and then only expose the things you, you really need. And then, you know, convert do loops, no longer have computed go to's, those kind of things. But it's that's there's nothing to stop you using old style do loops in Fortran 90. It's just a, it looks from a program perspective, it, it seems a little bit cleaner to use a do and do um, syntax. And of course, you can go for dynamic allocation rather than static allocation, which can let you write much more um, portable codes in, in some scenarios. <laughs> Excuse me. Sometimes, and I have seen this happen uh, in the past, you may have to write a code which has to, or at least some functions or subroutines, which have to be used, worked both in Fortran 77 and Fortran 90. So quite often I've seen this as a sort of file which is included in LA, which is compiled into other programs, and some of those programs are Fortran 77 and some are Fortran 90. Um, it is possible to do this, just requires a little bit of um, careful structuring. So you've got to be make sure that really your lines aren't too long, um, particularly um, to support the, the proper F77 mode. So you don't want uh, lines longer than 72 characters. Uh, continuation lines where you split a line across multiple lines you have to be careful with because you, so you have to put the at sign as the end character after the 72nd column for so that Fortran 90 understands it, but it's not included for Fortran 77 because it doesn't look beyond the 72 characters. But also put an at sign at the beginning of the line in column six so that Fortran 77 knows it's a continuation thing. It's a bit arcane, this, but it's easily done once you once you have once you uh, realise that's what you need to do. Um, you shouldn't have any inline comments, um, and you if you are have like, do have lines that have comments in them, just use an exclamation car, uh, <coughs> excuse me exclamation mark in the first column will generally let both F77 and F90 compilers understand what it is. It's a bit of an edge case, but we have come across it enough to make it worth mentioning sometimes 
supporting both uh, language standards at the same time is required and it is, it is possible. So that was sort of uh, 1995. Beyond that, as I said, there's going to be, there is a bunch of, um, there is a bunch of uh, Fortran 2003 things which um, which bring in new um, object-oriented programming stuff um, and uh, other things come in as well, such as the co-arrays for new parallel programming approaches. Uh, one of the nicest features is this uh, interoperability with C functionality. So there's a, in Fortran, I think it's I think this is formalized in 2003. In this module that the compiler provides called ISO C binding. Um, and this gives you the kind types for C intrinsic variables. That means that you can write code which can call C functions or C libraries, and you can be sure that you're correctly passing data between them. So that an integer in the Fortran program is exactly the same as an integer in the C program. So you can define the interface to Fortran to C routines so that they can be called from Fortran. Uh, and that's worth that's actually worth looking at. If you ever have to write a Fortran program which has to call C libraries, that's that's the place to go. Um, and then, as I said earlier, there's more involved functionality to do full object-oriented programming. Okay, so as we saw before, you can sort of make something that looks a bit like a class with a module carefully structured with the right interfaces. Uh, but Fortran 2003 and beyond introduces things that, that make this much more uh, formal and much more properly object-oriented programming. Particularly type bound procedures. So this example at the bottom here, we're extending my my person and and um, corridor thing. So I have a module. Inside that module, um, I've got a type. It's a derived type called person. That derived type has these two things in it: an array called name, and an integer called office number. That's what we saw before. But now inside the type, I can also say contains. And I can say contains procedure. And so I can say this function, sorry, this mod, this type, uh, this you know, type of variable has some data in it, some variables in it, but also has some functions which you can use. And the idea here is you're wrapping up your functions, your subroutines, along with the data that they work on together in a type. And you can sort of think of that as a class. Again, it's not quite a class. We'll come on and see that. Um, so, so Fortran lets you use this, this definition of class, right? So here, um, because we're going to be, because the variables that are type bound, sorry, because the routines, which are type bound procedures, are connected to a type. You need to be able to pass in that type to them. So there's this class keyword here, class brackets person intent in out self. And so if you can see my example here, I've got a type person. I've got this get name sub, uh, function here defined as a type bound procedure. I've put a special thing on it here called comma no pass, which is attribute no pass. That means but by default, it doesn't get given the type data that you know that it is part of. So I have to manually specify it here: class brackets person intent in out self, and I have to give it this special uh, variable now here. So uh, so type bound procedures take a class variable; it's automatically passed in, and it allows for data polymorphism. So you can actually de define a function here where it can take different kinds of um, types in um, and do, do work on them. Uh, so if I said instead of class person here, class star, um, it could take in any kind of type. Of course, that's, that's quite a wide 
set of functionality there and I'd have to do some work to make sure what specific type I was passed when I was called and make sure I did the right thing. Or I can also pass in a, a class here so I can say I'm passing in person. But as we'll see later on, you, you can have sort of generic classes where you, you person is, is one version of it, but you could also have people or or um, man or woman or something like that as a subclass of person. Just another slight note here, which is is a little bit confusing, but but, but not a problem. This name self here, um, it, in a lot of languages, something like self or this is a keyword. Um, in Fortran, self isn't a keyword. It's just a name of a variable. So I could have called that self anything uh, as long as it was the same here as it was here, as long as it was the same in the in function definition as it was in the, in the variable definition down there. Um, if your class variable, if your class variable you're passing in is allocatable, it's allowed to be allocatable, um, you need to see five a type when you actually allocate it. So allocate person, colon, colon, Fred. So this person here is the type and then Fred is the variable name I'm allocating. Or I can allocate it and give it a source copy the data from. So in my second example here, I say allocate Fred comma source equals Bob. That creates Fred the same size as Bob and also at the same time copies all the data that was in Bob into it. So I can do either of those. You would only do the second one if you wanted to instantiate a new variable with the, with the data from the old one. So to let you be able to pass in unlimited types of variables so this is very like void star in c but this class star in fortran um, there's a bunch of new functionality uh, particularly type is and classes where you can say okay you passed me in a variable you didn't tell me what it was i'll check now what type is it so here select type bob type is manager do this type it classes person do this classes default so i can use it in these I can take a variable in which has got um, a type I don't know at, at, at the time I've written the code, but then I can also inside the routine say, okay, if it's particularly if it's an integer, do this. If it's a real, do this. If it's a complex, do this. Um, and I can go, but for my own, I can also do that for my own types where I've created my own types. And there's specifically type is, which is you know, this is a specific type. This is a specific type I've defined. Or classes lets me say, is it this type or is it any of the subtypes of that? So you can, we can do, we can take one type and extend it to create a new type. And then that lets us do polymorphism on the object level here. So we can say, if I had created a person type and then a subclass of it, which was man, and a subclass of it was woman, and a subclass was child, I could pass in here person, man, woman, or child, and it would do the same thing in this classes person. Thing. So I can create um, classes and subclasses of those, which let me reuse the same functionality as long as they're all derived from the same base type. Or, or yeah. Uh, yeah. From, from the defined base type here. And you can check that because there's new functionality which says, does X extend type Y? Is X the same as type Y? So there's these functions to do that kind of thing. Um, and also, there's also a way of, of doing um, interfaces inside these type bound procedures. So what we saw before was this type bound procedure where we say procedure uh, real um, sum and procedure integer sum, and that's part of my type. I can also create a generic interface called my sum, which will call real sum or integer sum depending on the arguments passed to it. Now, this is very similar to what we saw before with this interface stuff. This is the Fortran 90 way of doing it, where we can create generic interfaces. Um, which bind to procedures, but this old Fortran 90 way of doing it is not bound to a type, so it's not doesn't have the data associated with it. Whereas here, this generic keyword lets us put an interface inside our type, 
which binds to the procedures in the type and can access the data inside the type. So you can sort of think of this type now really as proper class, where we have our data, our interface with overloading and our procedures, which are <coughs> restricted to that type. And, <coughs> excuse me, to, um, to add in the sort of final pieces for almost proper object-oriented programming, you can do class constructors where you, you give uh, an interface to the type. So my type person with my procedures here has an interface uh, which calls a specific function when you create that person type every time you do it. You don't have to have a, a, a constructor. You can have overloaded constructors, constructors, but the functionality is there. And likewise, the class can have a destructor as well. So something which is called when an object is it goes out of scope. Um, um, and here, that's using this keyword final double colon. I've called it cleanup, but that function could be called anything else. It's slightly annoying that they didn't do the constructor in the same way, because they could have put the constructor inside here and called it sort of beginning. Um, and that would have been a little bit cleaner, but, but this is the way they do it. If you want a constructor, you have an interface to the type. If you want a destructor, you use this final keyword to define it. And to, to, to round all that off, uh, and just as we come up to the to the hour, you can also do abstract and deferred classes. So this is the way we can create a class hierarchy where we say, I'm going to define an abstract class, but it's not going to have an implementation. And then I can create um, new classes that implement that. In my, in my example, I could have had a human as an abstract class and defined all the modules I wanted any human uh, all the procedures I wanted any human to implement, and then person could have been the concrete class of that, uh, and other things as well. Person and child could have been the. Not that I'm uh, saying that pe not people, of course, that was a, a bad example. Adults and child might have been a better example, um, could have uh, been concrete examples of that. So you can have an abstract class where you define data, procedures, and interfaces. Um, but you can't ever create a version, a variable of that abstract type. You have to have created a type which implements that, and then you can use that in your program. And the deferred procedure is a way of creating a function or subroutine name, which you want all classes which implement this abstract class to, Im to, to provide, but you're not going to implement it yourself in this abstract class. Um, these you know, these get a bit more complicated to understand, but with a little bit of um, you know, time and, and playing around with examples, it, it, the functionality really is relatively straightforward and just let you produce some quite nice um, setups. Uh, it's more involved than we have time to go in here, but I do have examples. And we, we do have a, a like a two day object-oriented programming training course, which we don't have scheduled at the moment, but we have all the material for that online and we can teach that. So if you are interested in the, you know, the more object-oriented side of this stuff and how you design the program and where you'd use an abstract class or a, a deferred procedure and uh, where you do your overloading, then certainly have a look at that. But these are uh, sort of Concepts which are, are, are relatively general to object-oriented programming. So you can also go and have a look at what sort of abstract classes and deferred classes in, in, in other programming languages look like as well. And then so there are also other new features. So I've already mentioned co arrays So they come in 2003, 2008, 2018 as well. Uh, there are, you can do pointers to variables, recursive procedure support select case functionality. So there are some new things in there. That's the majority of the new functionality in, in uh, Fortran uh, 1995, 2003 and beyond. Um, it's always worth having a look 
of the new things that have come into the language and then the new things that are coming in going forwards. Um, but the nice thing about the Fortran is, of course, it's always um, compatible. So you can use, you can quite happily write Fortran 77 over, I wouldn't advise it, programs and use them, compile them, use them now. You know, you can quite happily write Fortran 90 programs and, and compile them, run them now. Or you can go into a Fortran 2003 object origin stuff and um, the compiler support across the board for that is pretty good. Um, even this uh, more involved abstract deferred classes, uh, I think as far as I'm aware, pretty much all the compilers support all this now as well. So you can start uh, writing in this with, with, with reasonable confidence that your program will you'll be able to take and run your program on, on any system and um, uh, be able to do that in the future as well. So, yes, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I mean, for moving F77 to F90, if you're still um, working with F77 codes, is, I think, beneficial primarily from a programming, you know, um, efficiency and correctness standpoint because it's much easier to, to write Fortran 90 programs where you can have more confidence that you're doing the correct thing with the implicit none and, and all these kind of things. Um, you can get away in with just using Fortran 1995 functionality to write really quite nicely engineered programs with modules with array syntax, with interfaces, which pass a lot of the uh, you know sort of standards for what you would like for proper software engineering, uh, but also give you quite performant code. But the Fortran 2003 and beyond stuff is really nice. Uh, you don't have to go full, full object-oriented programming, but it can give you a nice way to do reasonable amounts of reuse of your code between uh, if you're going to be using it for uh, you know, multiple projects or if you're going to be using it in libraries and things like that, then that's a, probably a good way to go. And from our experience, as long as you're not doing something very involved, then the performance overhead um, of doing the object-oriented stuff generally is not uh, huge. I mean, of course, if you take an array and create an access uh, method for every single element of the array, then you're always going to have a performance overhead. But as long as you are putting your object-oriented stuff in at, the, at a reasonable level, then there should, there's no real uh, performance overhead uh, that we've seen for things like derived types and interfaces, um, those kind of things. Particularly if you've got a compiler with the optimization turned on, it can get rid of a lot of the performance overheads that are going on in there. So, yeah, the Fortran is, uh, is not a dead language. Uh, People often call it a legacy language, but it is still actively being developed. And there's a lot of uh, nice stuff in there. I quite like programming it. You know, the adage always is you should use the programming language that's the best for the the, um, the application you're developing. So Fortran isn't going to be the best for everything, uh, but it is still quite a, a sensible programming language choice for computational simulation particularly the libraries and the, and the built-in math stuff that's in there. So uh, it's always worth a look if you're going to be writing a new program. But if you are, you best use some of these new features like the modules, like the, the uh, private public stuff, like the array syntax. And then you'll end up hopefully with a program that's easier to maintain, easier to debug, and easier to support going forwards. Uh, is there any questions? We have training material on the Archer website for object-oriented programming in Fortran. Uh, so if you're interested, have a look at that, or just drop me an email, uh, or I'll get in touch. There's a question from Mark in here. Can you have multiple constructors? So yes, actually, you can have multiple constructors. Because it's an interface, a constructor can take a parameter or arguments in. So you can have multiple. You can only have a single constructor name. But that could instantiate to multiple constructors uh, under the hood, just using the same, let me share my slides again, just using the same overriding of functions that you would see here. So this idea of a generic my sum equals real sum or int sum, um, and in fact, 
uh, this one here where you've got interface, my sum, module procedure, real sum, module procedure, int sum, I think you can do the same thing for the class constructor here. And you could say module procedure person, but also module procedure. And I don't think there's anything, I'll check, but I don't think there's anything in the language standard which says you, you can't do that. Um, so, um, I think that is is possible. Of course, you'd have to differentiate it, initialized person and my initialized person would have to be different um, based on the arguments, the parameters that pass in. You can't have two functions of the same in there. But as long as you're passing in different parameters, then you could do that. Um, thanks for coming along. And uh, as I say, the slides will go up later and the as Claire has put a link in the chat to the latest run of the last run of the object oriented uh, programming course we did, which which has the more detailed slides and exercises in there. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, um, then have a look there.